Get more information on this and other astrophotography tips, articles, and tutorials at the photographingspace.com website. And don't forget to sign up for our weekly tips newsletter and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more tutorials and video. Hey, you're here with uh, Corey and Tanya Schmitz. Hello. And we're um, going to discuss DSLR night sky photography. This is a presentation that we gave at the 2014 um, Photo Film Expo in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, and anyway, we wanted to do an update of our previous um, DSLR night sky and photography this presentation. One, this one's really a, a shorter, more um, condensed one that focuses just on DSLR night sky stuff. Mm -hmm. So it cuts out planetary and all of the other stuff we did. If you want to review that, look at one of our previous um, um, videos, but uh, this one should give you a good starting point. Yeah, so let's get going. So, as we said, this is about astrophotography. It's wide field stuff, so the DSLR and lens, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're going to tell you how to shoot star trails and all the basic settings that you'd need. Um, for Milky Way for, photography. Yeah. Um, and all those kind of things that we want to do and we want to show you how to use just your normal camera on a static mm -hmm. tripod. Um, just to start off, um, the stuff you would need to know is you'd know, you know you'd need to know how to work your camera. So you need to know how to change the ISO, how to do aperture, how to do shutter speed, continuous shooting. So if you don't already know this, go back to your manual and make sure you familiarize yourself with um, how to change these settings. Anyway, carrying on, um, why is DSLR so popular with, uh, well, so good for night photography? Well, you know, one of the things is uh, the camera sensor can pick up so much more than our eyes can. Uh, there's so much more in the sky that, that, that you can see with a camera that your eyes cannot see. And those things with long exposure photography really uh, show us what's out there, what's mm -hmm. in the sky. Um, the thing is, your eye can't capture this much light. Uh, like a camera sensor can stay open for what back we, we, we're doing twenty to, to thirty second exposure, so you can gather a lot more photons, and it can show you a lot more detail of structure and color, and color in in the sky. The color, I think, is the, one of the most noticeable things as well. Mm -hmm. But now, as with anything, you have to know what you are shooting. So we're going to do a quick basic on um, astronomy and sky, and just to kind of give you a, a, a good basis of knowing what's out there. And what's out there when, in uh, mm -hmm. the different types of seasons and those kind of things. Because um, sometimes in the winter, you're going to be able to see, at least in the southern hemisphere, you're going to be able to see the Milky Way core overhead, but that's not going to happen in the summer. So mm -hmm. you need mm -hmm. to understand a little bit about something called the celestial sphere. Well, now, as we all know, um, the Earth spins on its own axis at a it's, it's about a 23 degree um, angle and as it's spinning it's obviously taking 24 hours to rotate and uh, with that it also orbits the sun so the the location of the earth in the solar system changes throughout the seasons and 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 as you can see here um, the celestial sphere the stars that we see they remain in the same position but it's actually it's it's your your place on earth that changes because the earth's rotating and it's orbiting the sun so the the easiest way and most helpful way to to know um, from your location what you can see we use software called Stellarium. Now this is free software available for download PC and Mac. Um, and yeah, I mean you can just input your location and date and time. As you can see here, we're moving along. You know where where certain things will be. You get to see the direction east, south, west, or whatever. So it's a good way to. Um, to kind of make sure you know from from where you're going to shoot what you're going to be able to see. Yeah, and different times of the year as well. So you can change the months, the the days, the times, and so you can decide. Okay, if I go out at uh, you know I need to be out at two a.m. in order for that the Milky Way core to be at the right spot in the sky. And once it is, mm -hmm. you know when to go shoot, and then you can actually get some sleep as well. So um, just just an important thing to note, if you are in the southern hemisphere, and uh, well, also in the north. I mean, the Milky Way, um, although the location isn't overhead as as it uh, is in the south, um, the Milky Way core comes out. Let's let's think. I think it's two or three months out of the year. Well, in the I mean, it's, it's oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so north is different to south. Um, in in the southern hemisphere, if you uh, start shooting about um, very very late evening, early morning, from March all the way through to 
um, I would say October it would be setting early evening so your your best Milky Way core photos can be done throughout that time but you just would have to um, check on the time that it rises. And in the northern hemisphere you're going to see the Milky Way core in the, um, show itself in the south um, right in the summer right in the dead of summer uh, which doesn't lend itself well to long exposure shooting but um, it will give you a lot of opportunity to see some beautiful Milky Way core. So, as with anything, if you want to shoot the sky, we're dependent on weather conditions. So, if you're planning a big shoot, make sure that you are aware of the weather conditions. Is it going to be cloudy? Because, I mean, as you can see here, with with clouds, you're not going to see anything. Yeah, and other weather conditions that you need to think about, too, are... Um, it, location dependent like you're going to need to worry about dust in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and um, moisture in the atmosphere because the more uh, dust and dirt there is the less you're going to see so if you want that perfect shot the best place to go is a dry clean dark place now the other thing to worry about would be light pollution um it's something that i mean <laughs> if you close to it any breaks city, our hearts <laughs> any any city center it's you, you're not going to get the sky you see on on some of these epic shots uh, as you can see here the light from the town completely blows out any detail that you would get from the milky way um and and really it's it's if you want those good shots it's worth traveling i mean i'd say anything what about 200 and well two 250 kilometers out from any city uh, city center yeah major cities you yeah. get around that yeah how well, much um, would that would be in miles ah uh, one point or you know 1.6 at least i don't want to do the math i think it's about two hours worth of driving yeah, you know you're gonna you're gonna have to drive you know two or three hours from the, from the uh, largest major city in order to get out into really dark skies mm. But now, obviously, light pollution is not the only thing we're going to have to worry about. You have to know the moon, um, the moon phases, when the moon is going to be full moon, when it's going to come up, when it's going to set, uh, obviously based on the location that you're shooting. I mean, this is a good example. The Look moon at this is the biggest, the lightest po light pollution uh, source, just as bad as any major city. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, the full moon is. Look at this. This is um, a completely blown out photo. It looks like it's daytime. You can see the Milky Way there, but I mean, it's it's completely blowing out the landscape. You can't see the detail in the sky, so it's vitally important. And um, I use datingtime.com to check, but I mean, there's normal apps and stuff you can use for smartphones, and just I mean, just Google it, and you'll see what the moon phases are. Mm -hmm. Now, landscape and composition. So you've you've all heard of the term the rule of thirds, and if you if you want to shoot a good landscape photo, you've got to give thought to what you're shooting and compose it properly. Obviously, the sky changes during the course of the night, but it it really I mean it's going to move so slowly that you do have ample time to compose and set up a good photo. Um, this shows um, a good a good example. Of, of how this photo was broken up and how I've placed the tree in the middle and, and you know, um, adequate sky to third sky. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't always have to dictate the photo. Um, One thing about this shot as well, um, you can see that the, the ground is illuminated. Mm -hmm. Now, we used the moon. Just a little bit of a moon. There was mm -hmm. a small sliver of a moon this night, and we needed to make sure that we had some moonlight in order to illuminate the landscape. So the moon isn't all bad, but, it, but you need to keep it in mind. But saying that, um, this kind of moon that you want, if you want to illuminate foreground, I'd say like um, a 10% or a 15% crescent would suffice. Yes, it doesn't and, take much. Yeah, and, and obviously if, if you look at um, at the moon phases, that that kind of illumination you can still get in the early early parts of the evening. And then with the moon setting, then you can bring out a really dark sky. So you can get the you best get of both, both worlds in, yeah, the same on, night. in the same night. I mean, this is just another example of, uh, I think this was us shooting in Sutherland, and obviously um, the sky there is a lot darker and a lot clearer, so you get to see a lot more detail. But um, with that, this was actually set up for a time lapse. Um, but it's a good example of, you know, using foreground and the sky for something. 
and well here's one of Corey's photos one of my favorites um this was done in the drakensberg mm -hmm. mm, oh and there we go Aurora. not another example yeah. of of using that foreground and, mm. and you, need, you need to use your environment around you um, set up your shots make sure that you've got ample foreground to show uh, the, the majesty of the area that you're in because uh, we were, this was shot in Iceland and I mean the ice beach and the mountain in the background and then that aurora in the sky. It, it, it really sets the, sets the, um, the, mood. the, tone, the moon, yeah. the mood for the photo. Um, also if you if you want to use, um, you, you, you can use your own foreground lighting, but mm -hmm. um, it's not something that we actually t um, cover a lot in detail in this presentation. But um, if you are stuck for lighting, um, you can illuminate yourself with whatever torches or whatever lighting. Okay, so this is the very interesting part, your camera and your gear at night. Um, this is where it can get expensive as well. Yes. But this is where you need to pay attention if you want to get those great shots. We're going to go through settings and uh, and camera gear. So the necessities for any shoot would be lots of battery yeah. power. You're going to be out away from power. You're not going to. You, you don't want to run out. So bring extra batteries. Um, bring large memory cards with you because you're going to take a lot of shots and you don't want to run out. Bring extras. Um, the the most important thing is the tripod mm, the, a, a sturdy solid tripod because if you i mean we're doing long exposure photos so 20 seconds 30 seconds you you really don't want any vibration on it yeah. and, and you want like where you set up and especially if you're doing um, time lapse shooting that you want it to stay in the same place one thing to do with the tripod as well you can take um, a tripod that maybe wasn't the most expensive tripod if you weighed it down um, if you use the center column and maybe hang a bag of rocks or a mm. bag of sand or a bag of coins, just something very heavy in the middle. Coins? A bag of coins? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> who doesn't travel around with, with bags of money? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, why not? But <laughs> you, you just you just want to make sure that it's heavy and that it's it's mm, down. So that it keeps it sturdy. Yeah, especially you're if you're thinking. shooting a, a star trail mm -hmm. um, where you're going to shoot many, many, many shots and mm -hmm. you don't want that tripod to move at all. The, the biggest thing, just get the sturdiest tripod that you can afford. The other thing, important thing, very is important. The, the ball head mount. Um, it, the the, the, the the mount on the tripod you see in this photo is actually not the best in the world. So you want to you want the one on the right side there, that ball head mount, um, because you want to be able to point your camera in any direction mm -hmm. and straight up. And yeah, the, like, the video like heads don't degree. allow you to do it. Mm -hmm. So doing a ninety degree straight up is is fairly simple with this kind of um, head. And also, um, if you look at the bottom, there's um, it, it's marked. If you want to do a panorama, so you want to shoot a pano, and um, so the the angles, the degrees would be marked. It's just easier to keep track of it. Mm -hmm. The other important, the last important thing that you need is some sort of remote shutter release cable. You can use just the inexpensive ones that you can find on on uh, online or, or any camera store. Um, you don't want to touch the camera when you shoot it, mm -hmm. so you need a remote way to activate the trigger. The, if you don't have one and you don't want to buy one, you need to use the um, two-second delay at least feature but, of your camera. Yeah, but then then you're set for taking a night photo. Then you still can't do star trails. So, I mean, you get entry-level ones. They're not um, expensive. Uh, the cheapest one, as long as you can um, have continuous shooting um, on, on it, you should be fine. So, choosing a lens... Very important. The glass mm -hmm. is one of the most important parts of the camera, um, possibly more important than the camera body itself. It mm -hmm. depends on which photographer you talk to. But yeah, but it also depends on how deep your pockets are. That's true, yeah. Lenses can be very, very expensive, but they're very, very important as well. Mm -hmm. if, if you invest in a good lens, it's not going to let you down. It is not. But anyway, um, back to, well, this is field of view on lenses. Yeah. And, and for um, astro stuff, you want to go as wide as you can. Um, this is a good example. This was shot at 12 millimeter with a fish eye. Um, it's a 60 second shot at ISO 3200. Um, and, and really, like, you can see horizon to horizon. And that was the Milky Way completely overhead. This is a good example of shooting at 14 millimeters. Um, now, obviously, we're still seeing a lot of structure and a lot of Milky Way, but um, the field view is a little bit um, tighter. And then um, shooting with 24 millimeters, this was, um, but this is also done on a full frame sensor, which yes. you have to keep in mind. Obviously, a crop sensor, your 24 millimeter isn't going to be a true 24. Right. Yeah. So when you when you know what the field of view is of a lens, um, <clears throat> it's it's 
dependent on that the size of the sensor in the camera. Mm -hmm. um, we use full frame cameras just because it gives us the better field of view and the better sensor quality. Uh, but you can use these. You can use a twenty four millimeter lens uh, on a on a crop sensor, no problem. Um, in fact, if you have the money to upgrade. Uh, upgrade your lens first unless you've got a really cheap camera and you you, you want to get a better sensor as well but the glass is very important the quality of the glass is extra important in astrophotography because you said it, those stars are, are need tiny. to be need, they need to be perfect um, in order for your photo to look good um, with a lower quality glass if when you zoom in on the stars, you're going to see um, chromatic aberrations. You're going to see uh, worse um, issues in the corners uh, where, where they might flare more, even in the center of if, it, if it's a bad lens. Um, you will notice the difference immensely, and, and the lens is going to make a lot of difference. The other thing with lenses that we need to remember mm -hmm. is with the more expensive lenses and the, and the, the better glass you're going to get, you're actually going to get um, a, a lower uh, depth of field, which... We're not so concerned about depth of field, but we want as much light to mm -hmm. get to that sensor as possible. So the faster the glass, the lower the aperture that you can go with that glass, the better. Uh, the, we'll show you later um, why, but the difference between you know f3.5 and f2.8 is actually pretty big. Um, you know, if, if you can only shoot at f4, uh, you're, you're going to know the difference. You're going to see the difference. So you need to get the fastest glass that you can afford and the best quality. Mm -hmm, definitely. So focusing. Focusing your lens is um, one of the most important parts of astrophotography. And if you um, don't spend enough time on focusing, it's going to ruin your shot. And you know, it's it's well worth getting to know your lens and uh, and, and your camera combination and the and the good focus point. Now, my new favorite saying is "infinity is not in focus." And I know a lot of people just um, promote putting your lens on infinity, and that should be fine for stars, but it's not really. You can have the most expensive lens, the most expensive camera, but if you just trust that it's that when you put your camera lens in infinity and take those shots, you're going to be sorry later because you didn't test. So, this is the best way to focus is to yeah, set your camera in infinity. Take a test exposure. Zoom in all the way on mm -hmm. that test, ex mm -hmm. test exposure, 100% on your LCD. Look at the stars in the middle. Look at them. Do they look in focus? Even if they look in focus, move the focuser ring either to the, to the right or to the left. But very slightly. Very slightly. And take another one. Decide if it looks a little bit more in focus or a little bit less in focus. And if it's less, move it the other way. Move it back just a little bit more. And take five or ten test exposures. It's worth taking the time because your photos are going to look so much better with those stars perfectly in focus. And it's going to make it look like you have more expensive gear than, than, than you may have. And you want to make the most of what you've got because focus is huge. Focus mm -hmm. is huge. Now, um, and obviously spending a good five or ten minutes getting to know the the um, where your focus point is on your lens um, it's worth the investment because it you know the stars aren't changing so once you get the perfect focus point for your lens and camera combination you're going to remember and use that all the time so I mean it, it's really worth investing and even when you find that focus point don't trust it every night always take at least a couple test exposures after you you you're pretty sure you know where that focus point is for your camera yeah and, and also remember that as soon as you start moving your camera you're probably going to move that focus point so I mean yeah. if, if you're out in the field and you're moving stuff about it's it's always worth checking back um, and also note that it, should you use that same lens on another camera, a different sensor, focus point's going to change because the relationship between the sensor and the and the, um, and the lens the itself, lens itself it, they're going to be changed. different distances yeah. uh, away from each other. So you, you need to make sure and test that on every camera and, and with every lens. And don't trust it. Always look at your test exposures. Mm -hmm. So and here we come to the. Uh, to the nitty gritty, the manual um, camera settings. And when we say manual, we mean complete manual. You are going to switch off in any automatic function that this camera has. As with um, your lens, you want full control over everything. Yeah, the biggest thing in astrophotography is full control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's start with um, like a simple setting, white balance. A lot of people always ask kind of color temperature, what should they be going for? Now this 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 example illustrates, and we're just changing this in Lightroom, um, it, when, you, when you range through a certain um, uh, 
degree of, of, of cold and warm in, in your white balance. Now, f um, daytime white balance? Daytime, I think, is around 5,600. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people will say, just set it to daytime because that's what it works well because, you know, the stars are suns. But uh, that's not necessarily the case because you need to worry about uh, the atmosphere. The atmosphere mm -hmm. plays a huge role in what your, your um, color looks like. So you need to take test exposures as well just for white balance. Um, if you are in a very, very dark area, you're going to be able to, to warm up that color a little bit, um, depending on the atmosphere. But you're, if you are in a light polluted area, like here in Johannesburg, we have to shoot at 2,900 or less uh, sometimes because of the light pollution mm -hmm. is so bad. It just depends on the location. It depends on the time of year. It depends on the atmosphere. So you need to test that. The other thing is you need to make sure you shoot raw so that in the end, when you go back and process these photos, you can, you can actually change, change it. Yeah. Well, you know, normal night settings on warm, um, on on white balance would be somewhere around three thousand four hundred to four thousand. Really, just depends on your location. Yeah, but that would be the the general. It's a good um, place to yeah, start. Yeah, it's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Then uh, your image quality set to raw. Yeah, like what we said before, uh, for white balance, it's important. Uh, there's a lot of other reasons uh, because you don't want to shoot to JPEG. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to lose a lot of data. When it when it saves it as JPEG, it uh, compresses that down to 8 bits, which is not good enough. Um, you're going to need all of the data in the image that you can possibly squeeze out of it because in post-processing, when you edit your photos in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever you'd like, you need to have as much data there as possible. These things mm -hmm. are very faint. They're, they're very far away. There's a lot of stuff there that you may not see right away that you can pull out when you adjust the curves and the levels mm -hmm. and the histogram in your in your post process. Yeah, and that's, I mean, the quality is all there in your raw photos. Um, then for um, the camera noise reduction feature. Now, I know, I mean, this is a Canon feature. I'm not quite sure about the other brands. Um, but, uh, you, you know, it, it, it's also, it's dependent on what you shoot. Definitely, if you're shooting star trails, it's something that you want to disable because um, your your in-camera noise reduction will take a dark frame at, at the same length as what your light frame, your photo was. So if you did a 20-second exposure, it's going to disable the camera for 20 seconds to take that dark frame and subtract it to get rid of the noise in your photo. And obviously, for star trails, that's not going to work because you cannot disable your camera camera and it's uh, star trails continuous shooting but for general sky photos if you feel that it improves your photo then um, you know do it I personally don't like in-camera noise reduction because the post-processing software is so good and and I mean we've got good sensors it's so it's, it's very much camera dependent too we also like to have full control over the data and mm. <clears throat> as soon as you do that that um, in-camera noise reduction or high ISO uh, noise reduction in the camera it does alter the data that's that you've captured so you don't you lose a little bit of the control you want to be able to mess with the uh, photos that you take as much as you possibly can and you don't want to be limited by what mm -hmm. your camera may have done for you mm-hmm so shutter speed okay well your shutter speed is going to de be dependent on the field of view that you're shooting mm -hmm. um here in, in the example you can see we're switching between two um two photos with e the exact same settings um and one was shot at 25 seconds and the other one was shot at 30. so obviously the longer you can expose your photo for the better result you're going to get the more light you're able to capture but um the problem is you with with a longer exposure um, it depends on the field of view of your camera and and how bad your star trails are going to be um, like here this is a good example um, we see that the stars trail now this as we explained before the earth is rotating so the sky is moving across um, the the course of the night and 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 obviously we can see this in, in this exposure this was a 30 second exposure and you can see the trails on you now um, I mean Corey you know the rule of 500 yeah it's actually I think it's the rule of 600 but mm -hmm. uh, I like the rule of 500 a little bit better because it tightens things up a little more um, what you want to do is you want to take 500 divide it by the focal length of your lens so say 500 divided by 24 and I'm gonna get my my phone out here to do a, uh, <laughs> use the calculator function on this thing um, know this. yeah I know it's a, so say you want to take 500 divided by a 24, 24 millimeter lens. lens your maximum exposure is going to be about 20 seconds um, this is just a good starting point again don't trust these numbers because as soon as you put this lens a 24 millimeter lens on a crop frame camera 
you're going to lose time. You won't mm-hmm. be able to shoot for 20 seconds. And even at 20 seconds, you might still get some star trails. So you need to be careful. You need to use this as, as, a, as a good starting point, take a test exposure, and then look at zoom in and look at what your stars look like. If it's a single shot, if it's not a star trail, and you want that shot to look good, you want to, get, you want to minimize Minus, those star yeah. trails. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, if, if, if we're shooting, let's say, at a fish eye, let's say at 8 millimeters or 12 millimeters, then obviously it's going to be a lot more forgiving because of the field of view, you don't see that much and uh, the, the, the trails aren't that noticeable. And like I just did the rule of 500 on a 8 millimeter lens um, and it's right about 60 seconds. So you can shoot a lot longer given that much shorter focal length. Mm-hmm. But you still need to be careful. So mm-hmm. do a test. Well, and, and now the other factors that come into play, once you've pretty much nailed down what your shutter um, speed would be, um, would be the ISO settings and aperture settings, which we'll take a look at. Now, here is Milky Way core shot at ISO, um, ISO 400. This was done in a dark location. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, these are settings that you will need to change to get the most out of your, um, your, your photos. And we're going to go through a few different uh, mm-hmm. ISO settings to show you. So you can see a little bit more detail starting to come through. And yeah. ISO 1600 looks great. Mm-hmm. You know, it looks much better. This is, um, you know, the, the same shot, and all we did was change the ISO settings. Uh, these are real shots um, straight out of the camera. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to show you what they look like. Um, and, and, and and obviously to mention what, what, what ISO is, I mean, it's, 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 it's your the camera. Gain. Yes, it's, it's the it's gain of your camera, camera sensor. So you take, you take the light that your camera is going to uh, collect, and it, it basically turns up the volume of your, of mm-hmm. your uh, camera sensor. Now, some cameras can handle a lot more. Some can handle a lot less. It just depends on the quality of the sensor and how noisy it's going mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. But um, we've, we found, um, obviously, the ISO setting also um, it, it differs depending on where you're shooting. And if, if you're shooting in a light polluted sky, I mean, there's a lot of ambient lighting that's going to um, drown out that photo because the ISO is um, it's, it's going to amplify that light. So you know, I think roughly shoot at 400 or yeah, in a, in a light polluted area. Uh, yeah, yeah, here in Johannesburg, I believe we shoot at uh, ISO 400. So. Mm-hmm. And, and and if you're in a dark sky location, I mean, push at 3200 is a is an optimal spot. For yeah, ISO give it a try. Now, the last one would be aperture settings. Now, obviously, that's going to be lens dependent, but in, in general, we're looking at a, a 2.8 or a 4 or even a 5.6. Yeah, if you've got if you've got an f2.8 lens, shoot it f2.8, uh, zoom in and look at those stars. If you, if you don't see a lot of artifacts around them, if the stars still look round and they look nice, then go for it. Shoot it uh, f2.8. If you do see some uh, little... Uh, if the stars look flared, if there's something, it could be a focus problem or it could be a glass problem. And if it's a glass problem, then you can fix that. Um, you just need to stop down the uh, the uh, aperture just a little bit. So if you've got an f to lower a lower priced f 2.8 lens and you don't quite like the way the stars are looking, stop it down to maybe 3.5 right, and yeah. see what it looks like. Yeah, yeah. And and in, in this example, you can see um, again the same Milky Way call we were shooting and. Um, We've highlighted, if you look in the circle, the different um, um, aperture settings, and it, it shows you how much the light gets amplified. I mean, uh, it's the same ISO and the same time settings, it, and just the aperture setting changes. So you could see, and this is why investing in a good lens is vital. Fast glass mm-hmm. is awesome. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to checking out your histogram, your, your histogram is going to be able to tell you a lot about the photo. Um, you, you can't always rely on what you see on the back of your LCD once, or once you've taken the photo. There's sometimes a lot of data there that goes unnoticed. Um, so paying attention to the, the histogram can tell you a bit more about what you just captured. What looks good on the back of your LCD screen on your camera isn't always going to look good on the computer screen when you take your photos home. You might be disappointed and the best way to make sure that you're not disappointed is to trust the data, trust the histogram. The histogram is going to tell you a lot and will show you what to look for in a night sky photo. So um, with uh, just a little bit of uh, info on a histogram, um, it, it, it's Represented in a graph, and each level is re- represented by a vertical bar in the in the histograms um, graph. So um, it ranges from the dark to the light point, 
and I think here we can see. So um, this this would be the data for an underexposed photo. Um, the entire graph shows you the available dynamic range of the image. So this is the image from, from dark to light. This neutral exposure, this is what a, a daytime photo, a well-exposed daytime photo is going to look like. There's a lot of dark spots, there's a lot of bright spots, everything is relatively uh, evenly distributed mm -hmm. throughout that graph. So now if we go to the next one, this is an overexposed photo. Uh, these may be obvious to you, but it's just something mm -hmm. you need to look at and something that really, really helps at night. So you want to avoid these three, even the daytime photo. You, what you're looking for in a night sky photo is this. You want it exposed to the left. You want that mountain of data to be in the left third mm -hmm. graph, part of the histogram graph. Um, you can see we're not missing any data. The, it, it's, it's not completely pushed to the left. Um, it's, it's well exposed. Um, and this is, I mean, if you look at and, and you divide this into um, qu uh, quarters, it'll most of the data will be in the in the second quarter, first and second quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you want you want a lot of room on the right side in mm -hmm. order to move that because in post processing we're going to move that mountain that, of data. Yeah. We're going to push it to the right so that uh, so that those dim things that you can hardly see so that so that they they brighten up and you can see the beautiful gas and dust that's in the Milky Way. So here's just a good example of a, a daytime photo, some Icelandic A real horses. daytime photo. <laughs> yeah, this is about one of the few uh, daytime photos that we take. Because mm -hmm. um, it had was, a horse in Yeah, because it had a horse. <laughs> so, <laughs> a horse's head. Oh, oh hey, <laughs> This yeah. is the horse head nebula in Iceland. Yeah. No, not so much. But um, anyway, this is a good representation of that daytime histogram that we are not going mm -hmm, for. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to show you next, we're going to show you a nighttime histogram, a real nighttime histogram on a real photo. And, and obviously you see that little spike there on the on, on the complete left that would be the black at the bottom of the frame and and this is also a good point to note that this was done this photo was shot uh, on a complete new moon so there was absolutely no illumination from the moon so I can't see foreground so um, you know it, keep in mind if you're going to shoot landscape and don't go shoot on new moon because everything will just come up like unless you want silhouettes and in that case go for it yeah so and, and and this is another example just to show you kind of where the data lies so once you know how to handle your camera and the settings, then you the, the then other we start part, wrangling the computer. Yeah, <laughs> it's processing. Um, now here's a good example of a, a Milky Way image straight off off the camera, and then one that I did in post processing. Um, this was shot at 20 seconds, ISO 3200 at f 2.8, and mm. on a 24 millimeter lens. Yeah, there's a lot you can do to the photos. Um, you may think that on the back of the, the camera, these photos look wonderful and you, you export them to your computer. If you're shooting raw especially, there is a lot more there than, than, you, may, than you may think. Mm. So this is why processing is so important. Yeah, and, and, and please note that you know every single beautiful Milky Way image you see has been processed. There is no way that you can get that... Um, uh, can get that kind of amount of detail out of a camera without applying some techniques and it's not cheating it's not like we are only enhancing what is really there it's not faking it's not putting stuff there that's not there it's just enhancing and, and, and adding some contrast so here's a quick example of um, a Milky Way edit, and, and we mainly use Lightroom, um, but I mean all, all software, cross board, things are pretty much the same. Now what you really want to look at doing is you want to um, bring up the midtones, you want to increase the saturate, um, saturation, you want to look at the vibrance of the image. Um, uh, I mean, Corey, what are the other points you look oh, at? You know, I look at, um, I look at sharpness. I look at noise reduction mm -hmm. is, is yeah, a big definite one. definite noise reduction. Playing with the exposure a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you can go and, and, and set the, the white balance. You can um, set the curves. The thing is to do is to, is to boost those midtones, boost the, the um, you want to move that histogram a little bit to the right. And you want to look at it. You want to look at the image. You want to look at the histogram. You want to look at the color balance. Um, you want to push that push that stuff mm -hmm. um, p learn your processing software you learn how to use it and learn what to do you know the major things to, to, to mess with are levels and curves saturation sharpness and uh, white balance um, noise reduction those are those are the big ones once you master those you can do so much with your photos and you're going to to learn a lot uh, the other thing to note about processing is don't uh, don't just process the photo once and then throw away the raw because 
after a year or so, you're, mm-hmm. you're going to get, or even a month, who knows how long, depends your on how fast it'll learn. Your skills are going learn. to improve. Yeah, your skills are going to get so much better, and, and the next time you process that photo, it's going to look like a brand new photo mm-hmm. because your skills have improved so much. So mm-hmm. save your data and go back and process, and it's great. It's a great thing to practice. And practical, how to shoot star trails. This is the moment we've all been waiting yeah. for. Is yeah, it? yeah. I've been waiting for this moment. I would, I've been waiting to tell you all about this. <laughs> wow, let's tell them. Let's tell everyone. <laughs> okay, cool. So shooting star trails in four easy steps, and really, you know, if if you just stick to these four steps, you can shoot star trails. Yeah. So there's there are sub steps in the steps, but you know, <laughs> as always. <laughs> yeah, it's generally four steps. Okay, so composition, that's important. Um, as we said before, um, obviously the rule of, two, um, of thirds. Now, uh, it's, it's something you can maybe stick close to. For, for star trails, I mean, you can shoot straight up and just have f- stars full of field, but that's not exciting. You want to create some kind of reference. You want to relate um, the terrestrial with um, the, the sky. So you want to see some movement, and, and, that's, and that's best shown with having some foreground objects. This is actually a house. We're actually sitting inside there right now. <laughs> Creepy. No. Well, huh? Right now? <laughs> yeah. In that photo. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've learned to process uh, the future. Okay, cool. So composition. Give some thought to what you want to shoot and, and, and where you want to um, compose the sky around that. Obviously, test exposure. Is yeah, important. we've talked about test exposures this mm-hmm. whole time. You need to test what the photos are going to look like. You need to make sure your focus is in. You need to make sure your white balance is set to the way you want it to look. You want to make sure um, the ISO and the aperture settings are, are set to, the, to what makes a good photo because you're going to take all of these photos, you're going to take hundreds of them, and if you, if you get it wrong, it's going to be a waste. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we're going to get to acquisition, Um, and this is obviously based on your test exposure. Once you've done your settings, you're just going to put it into continuous shooting and carry um, carry on shooting. And then processing, we're going to show you how to put all of these together into one star trail. Mm-hmm. So, and, and this is a bit, um, you know, for the Southern Hemisphere, how to find um, the South Celestial Pole, because we do not have a training star like you guys. Oh, training North. star. Yeah. That's a dig at the Northern folks. Yeah. I used to be one, so I understand that. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so you, if, if you want to compose um, around the South Celestial Pole and you want to get those stars going around, um, the easiest way to, to actually find it is just if you point south. Um, and, and you can do that with any compass. But if you are looking for that specific point, um, the, the easiest way to do it is to use the Southern Cross and take the two pointer stars Harder and Rigel Kent, draw a line between them, then intersect it with the line going down. Then take the Southern Cross, the top and the bottom stars, connect those and carry on drawing a line and where they meet and intersect the other line that is where you will find the southern cross at least close enough Mm, at least close enough close enough to compose and obviously another important fact is try and see if you can compose um, in in daylight it's going to allow you uh, much greater flexibility and you just you'll you'll, you'll be able to see what your photo is going to look like and, and there we go. That was the same shot I looked at. Because, um, I mean, you don't want to walk around at night trying to find a perfect spot to shoot from. So daytime. You're going to trip on stuff. Oh, yeah, that too. Don't trip. Don't <laughs> fall. Don't hurt yourselves. Which actually brings me, it makes me think of. How many times have you been injured on our trips? Maybe twice. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, what we did not actually say in a necessity in one of our previous slides is a headlamp. Yes, That's something you need you a headlamp so you, you don't know. trip and hurt yourself. <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. So test exposure. Um, oh, no, we're still on composition. Um, this is actually one of Corey's um, new little favorites that he found. Yeah, this is an augmented reality app, um, and I forgot what the name of it was, um, but there's there's a lot of augmented reality apps out there, and this is one specifically for um, shooting sunsets and sunrises and Milky Way photos. And moon photos. And moon photos. So you, you can figure out, we're using this app, um, you can, you, it's called Photo Pills. Um, Photo Pills, yes. You can and you can use this app to figure out where the Milky Way is going to be on a certain day at a certain time mm-hmm. in a location where you're pointing your smartphone at, your, your iPhone. Um, and you, you, so you know, I can come back to this one spot at 11 p.m., and take a shot, the Milky and that Milky Way is going to be right coming right out of that tree. So I can you know go and, and set my shot up, you know, uh, take it, be there for maybe 30 minutes, and then go mm-hmm. home and go to sleep. Um, it, it, it could actually save you a lot waiting. of time. Yeah, no, 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 it 
does, it does. Um, so then test exposure. Now, obviously, we, we spoke about focusing earlier. And what you want is you want sharp stars and you want to find the correct exposure for your location. So based on where you are, the... Um, the ISO and the aperture will, will will change, but I mean we 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 discussed that earlier on. Now the one thing um, that we didn't say um, with with obviously now the field of view that you've got set up for your shot is you're shooting continuous exposures with star trails, so so you don't have to be that concerned about shutter speed. So when you expose test on a 30 second exposure because you want you, you, you're going to shoot the longest that your manual setting allows for um, and because you want to create those trails now having star trail uh, the having star slight trails is in, okay in single fo- yeah because you're going to ov- overlay them and it's going to create those nice lines that you want so when you're doing a test exposure expose for 30 seconds and, and one of the other th- um, things we, we discussed earlier also, in-camera noise reduction should be switched off. Yeah. Um, now, that's a definite. Otherwise, you're going to get um, gaps in your stars. And mm-hmm. if, if your camera is disabled for 30 seconds, every um, alternate frame, it's not going to create continuous lines. So the other thing is to make sure you enable the continuous shooting mode on your camera, on the drive mode, um, which will, as soon as you lock in the shutter cable, as soon as one exposure is finished, another one will begin yeah. one after another after another after another you're going to shoot as long as you can um, and we'll talk about that next so acquisition this is uh, this is the this is the easy one this is where you've done your tests you've 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 done your composition you know what the frame's going to look like now all you do is you lock the uh, the, the remote shutter release cable on uh, you make sure your camera is in that continuous shooting mode and you let it go Mm-hmm. And and let it shoot. At, I would say at least three to four hours to get you some nice long trails because the, the thing you need to think about is don't go for the minim, minimum time. Go for more no, than what yeah. you think you might need because you can always throw out photos. You can always use a, 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 a section, a, a sub uh, a subgroup of the photos that, that you've shot. So shoot more than you think you might need. Shoot until you fill up your card. Shoot until you've, you run out of battery uh, mm-hmm. because you'll love what you can get. This is also where, um, like, I just want to reiterate the use of a good tripod because obviously um, you do not want your camera um, position to change throughout the night. So good, um, good cam, uh, good ball mount head and a good tripod just to have it sturdy. And obviously, uh, this is the post-processing part. Um, we uh, like using Star Stacks. It's also a free software um, for Windows and Mac platform. And it really is the easiest way to process your stars. Now, um, the, the It's very simple to use. All you do is you drag, drag and drop. JPEGs uh, after you've already processed them in Lightroom and gotten them the way you want um, everything. You can, you can do a batch export. This is what we do. We shoot, we shoot everything in RAW, then we go and edit uh, one of the photos in Lightroom. Room, we apply those develop settings to all the photos, then we export them all as JPEGs and we drag and drop them into Star Stacks. Mm-hmm. We use the lighten mode um, of, of Star Stacks and then we hit the process button mm-hmm. and then it, as you it saw... Just, it stacks it, it's just blend, it's, it's, it's putting them on top of each other, blending them in a lightening mode. And also to add, Star Stacks can, can generate um, um, small movies for you or like a comet movie. I think we saw it on the previous slide that you did with that Star trail so it's really powerful software once you shoot a star trail you can kind of do many cool things with it so Mm. this is the final product Mm -hmm. of that of that image Um, just quickly created in star stacks um, using using the 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 process that we just outlined Mm -hmm. and there I mean it's four simple steps it's composition doing a test exposure then setting up your acquisition and continuous shooting and then post processing star trails are actually fairly simple to do and and they're so very powerful a lot of people mm-hmm. want want to do them and a lot of people ask ask us how to, how we create these star trails and these this is the just a quick overview of of how we do them mm-hmm. uh, we may create a, a tutorial in the future that's a little bit longer More that detailed. will that will show you exactly what to do but um, this is really how easy it is um, now coming up we've actually got uh, just some examples um, 
These these are uh, this is two photos that um, some people actually a few photos of some people that we went out and did some some uh, a workshop with. And there these was people, one night one one, one night, night workshop, and they and they listened to um, the the guidance and the and the same settings we just gave to you. Um, it was on site. They've never you? shot night never photos. Never shot before. night photos before. They knew their cameras because they like novice daytime photographers. But yeah, they were, I mean they were able to capture stunning views of the sky. Get more information on this and other astrophotography tips, articles, and tutorials at the photographingspace.com website. And don't forget to sign up for our weekly tips newsletter and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more tutorials and video.